All right, what is up, everybody? Tom McGraw here with another stream in our Learn Rust live series. We've been going strong. We're on chapter 14. You know, you would have told me a few months ago now that we'd be on here, chapter 14. Whew. Clam Watson in the chat, let's go. We made it. We made it pretty far. <clears throat> We've gone through chapters 1 through 13, obviously. That's why we're on chapter 14. We did all the rustling exercises, except for the one on... Right? We didn't do the one on threads. It's all right. Not... We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. But we made it really far. So this is exciting. Hope you're all excited. And if you, know, if you couldn't make some of the streams, that's okay. Usual plug. You know it's coming. The YouTube. We got them all here. Chapters one through thirteen are here. What have we done? Let's look. Let's look a little bit, right? We did a guessing game. We did ownership. Some practice programs. Slices. We learned about structs, enums, modules, collections, exercises with collections, error handling, generic types and traits. We did the rustlings exercises. We did building a grep clone in the command line. Right. We did command line. We did. Uh, Chapter 12, we did we did some testing. We did some functional programming. So we've done a lot. If you missed any of them, check it out. It's all here on the YouTube. We don't need to go through the whole spiel. You get the idea. YouTube.com. Search for Tom McGurl. If you like what you see, subscribe. We get notifications. We also got some one-off content, building a Rust development environment with Docker. Right? That's easy. Some AWS live coding with serverless API. And before that, we did a React Native app with Recoil, JS, Expo, React Native, obviously, <coughs> TypeScript. <coughs> Excuse me. So that was really cool. And we'll do more of that. I think coming up, we're going to do a brief video on Electron. Um, so that keep an eye out for that. Electron, if you're not familiar with, is a way to build cross-platform native desktop clients using web technologies. So I got to experiment with it a little bit at work for a project. So I'm excited to share what I've learned and uh, expect that to be coming soon. And also, I'm going to be doing a brief uh, probably like YouTube video on making a asynchronous web request with Rust. So I did some reading up on that because I was interested in it. And hopefully I can turn that into a cool video for everyone to check out. Should be pretty sweet. Again, you want to get the latest happenings. You want some internet drama turned into songs, right? Check out my Twitter. I'm posting stuff there. I also post when I go live. You want notifications. And if I create any content, I'll post it there as well. Again, as usual, everything we create here on the Learn Rust live stream is going up in the Learn Rust live repo. So we got chapters 13 up here. You can see the commits we've done here. All the work we've been doing. Chapter 13, right? Chapter 12, 11, and so forth. So it's all here. If you want to pull it down, check it out. Use it as a reference. If you have your own repo going, that's great too. But this is just up here in case you want to check that out. All right, today, it's all about chapter 14. Where did we leave off? 13, we did closures and iterators. Did a little functional programming. Today we're going to be finding out about crates. We know about crates. We've used them, <clears throat> right? We know about cargo. We're going to learn a little bit more. So I'm excited about that. As usual, if you've watched these before, if you've watched the stream live or you've watched on YouTube, you always know we got to give a shout out to the authors of the book, right? We wouldn't be here without them. Couldn't be doing this without them. Couldn't be doing my Rust journey here along with all of you. So uh, let's give a shout out to Steve Klobnik and Carol Nichols and anyone from the Rust community that's contributed to the Rust programming language book. It's been fantastic. They made this book free. It's accessible. You could change the themes. You could jump chapters. So fantastic work here. I'm sure it took a lot of time and love. And uh, now we can capitalize on that on this stream and, and learn. So excited for that. So thanks again, Steve Klobnik, Carol Nichols, and anyone from the rest community that contributed. All right. Now, chapter 14. <coughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. We've done stuff with cargo, right? We've been using cargo for a lot of stuff. And we've used crates. We used the random number crate in our guessing game. And I believe we've used some... I, I think that might be, have been the only one we've used. So we're going to probably use more of that. We use cargo for creating new projects all the time. We use cargo new whenever we create a project in our folder here. Uh, so if you're looking at a folder, all of these projects, they have a cargo toml. These were created with cargo, right? And so we're going to go a little bit more into that, learn a little bit more about cargo so we can get uh, some experience there and also crates. So without further ado, let's jump right in, right? All right. 
I'll keep it up here and we'll move it. If I need to pull up code, I'll pull the code up. But for now, let's just keep this up. All right, so let's see what we have here. Put this here. All right, so far, we've used only the most basic features of Cargo. We've used it to build, run, and test our code, but it can do a lot more. In this chapter, we'll discuss some of its other more advanced features to show you how to do the following. So we're gonna learn how to customize your build through release profiles, it's pretty sweet, publish libraries on crates.io, organize large projects with workspaces, install binaries from crates.io, and extend Cargo using custom commands. Cargo can do even more than what we cover in this chapter, so for a full explanation of its features, check out the documentation. All right, <clears throat> I'm ready, I'm going, I'm ready to jump in. All right, let's see. Customizing builds with release profiles. Let me close that so we can get a full view here. I'll zoom in one, two to make it a little crispier. All right, customizing builds with release profiles. In Rust, release profiles are predefined and customizable profiles with different configurations that allow a programmer to have more control over various options for compiling code. Each profile is configured independently of the others. Cargo has two main profiles, the dev profile Cargo uses when you run Cargo build, and the release profile Cargo uses when you run Cargo build with the release flag. The dev profile is defined with good defaults for development, and the release profile is defined with good defaults for release builds, right? So it's gonna have those defaults based on what you're trying to do. These profile names might be familiar from the output of your build. So if we run Cargo build, you see finish dev unoptimized plus debug info targets. Cargo build release, finish release optimized. So pretty cool. The dev and release shown in this build output indicate that the compiler is using different profiles. Cargo has default settings for each profile uh, that apply when there aren't any profile sections in the project's Cargo TOML file. By adding profile.star sections for any profile you want to customize, you can override any subset of the default settings. For example, here are the default values for the op level setting in the dev and release profiles. So here we Cargo TOML, profile dev, they're customizing it here with op level zero, profile release with op level three. The op level setting controls the number of optimizations the rest will apply to your code with a range from zero to three. Applying more optimizations extends compiling time. So if you're in development and compiling your code often, you want faster compiling even if the resulting code runs slower. That is the reason the default op level for dev is zero. So again, what that means is it's gonna do fewer optimizations. So it will compile your code faster, but your code itself will run slower. Will you notice it? Maybe not. but if we wanna go for release, we're gonna up that, that level. So when you're ready to release your code, it's best to spend more time compiling. You only compile in release mode once, but you'll run that compiled code many times. So release mode trades longer compile time for code that runs faster. That's why the default op level for release profile is three. So again, it ranges from zero to three. You can override any default setting by adding a different value for it in Cargo Toml. For example, if you wanna use optimization level one in the development profile, we can add these two lines to our project's cargo.toml file. So I will pull up a cargo.tom to show you an example. And of course, here's an example here. Let's go to chapter 14. I don't have anything, but in iterators, I have one. And you can see the profiles aren't defined and that's because it's using the defaults. We don't need to define them if we're fine with the defaults. If we do, however, want to override that op level, we would then define that. So for example, if we wanted to um, change the op level for dev, we would do something like profile.dev and then here, Opt level equals one. And that's the nice thing about Tomo. It's very readable, right? Pretty cool. All right. The code, this code here, the profile dev op level one, it's going to override the default setting of zero. Now we run cargo build. Oh, I just realized I'm in your way. Gosh, what am I doing? Let's get out of your way. Sorry. Let's do this. Better, better. There we go. So now we run the code, it'll use the op level one when we're in dev. Cargo will apply more optimizations than default, but not as many as it would in the release build, which again would be level three. For the full list of configuration options and defaults for each profile, see Cargo's documentation. So we can pop that up and take a quick look and we'll come back to this. So, but you can see profiles, overflow checks, disable integer overflow checks, op level, we have the basics here, debug, <clears throat> pretty cool debug assertions. So this is pretty great panic. The setting controls the C flag, which controls which panic strategy to use. So there's different panic strategies, unwind, unwind the stack upon panic, terminate the process upon panic. So that's pretty cool. 
Once set to unwind, the actual value depends on the, the default of the target platform. It's so pretty cool. So a lot of different things we can do here, right? Test. Test is an op level of zero, debug level of two, whereas release has a three with debug false and dev has a op level zero with debug true. So pretty cool. All right. Anyway, moving on. Okay, pushing a crate to crates.io. We've used packages from crates.io as dependencies of our project, but you can also share your code with other people by publishing your own packages, right? So the package ecosystem is made by other Rust stations or other Rust developers, and we can make our own as well, just like any package environment that you may be a part of in whatever language you're using, if any. So in JavaScript, you know that uh, if you're familiar with JavaScript, we share packages via NPM, the Node Package Manager. If you're using Python, right, you might be familiar with pip. Or if you're using Ruby, you're probably familiar with Ruby gems. Uh, if you've used Homebrew, you're probably definitely familiar with Ruby gems as it's built on Ruby. Um, Elixir, right? You're using hex packages. So different languages, you can have different dependencies there. So pretty cool. The crate registry at crates.io distributes the source code of your packages. So it's primarily host code that is open source. So when you put your code on crates.io, it's going to host the source code of your packages. So what it means there is it's open source in that it's publicly available, right? People can see the source code, hence open source. All right, you know what I'm saying? Rust and Cargo have features that help make your published packages easier for people to use and to find in the first place, right? You want your packages to be found. They're gonna have good SEO, right? So we'll talk about some of these features next and then explain how to publish a package. Making useful documentation comments. <laughs> Accurately documenting your package will help other users know how and when to use them. So it's worth investing the time to write good documentation. You want to let people know how to use your package so that they use it, and you want them to know how to use the crate so that they can share it with others, right? Understand it. If it's hard to read, you've all come across something that didn't have great documentation, and you usually just avoid it and try to find something else, right? So in chapter three, we discuss how to comment Rust code using slashes. Rust also has a particular kind of comment for documentation, known conventionally as documentation comment, that will generate HTML documentation. The HTML displays the contents of the documentation comments for public API interns, I'm sorry, public API items intended for programmers interested in knowing how to use your crate as opposed to how your crate is implemented. So it's usage. So documentation is not about the implementation, it's about the usage of that code. <clears throat> documentation comments use three slashes instead of two and support markdown notation for formatting the text. Place documentation comments just before the item they're documenting. So using the listing below, it shows an example of a documentation comment for an add one function. So we have an add one function here, and you can see here it says add one to the number given. That's what the function does. Here are some examples. Let argument five, let answer equal my crate, add one arg, and it's gonna show you that it prints out six. And here's the implementation of the add one function. Again, it's a public function. A documentation comment for a function. Here we give a description of what the add one function does. Start a section with the heading examples and then provide code that demonstrates how to use the add one function. We can generate the HTML documentation for this documentation comment by running cargo doc. This command runs the Rust doc tool distributed with Rust and puts the generated HTML documentation in the target doc directory. Let's give that a shot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to toss this over here and we're going to open this here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open up. I made a chapter 14 folder here. And in here, I'm going to do cargo new. And we'll just call it um, documentation. We'll CD into that folder. And we'll just open up a new terminal there so we get our Rust analyzer. And here we have our source, main, and I'm just gonna create the function add one just like they have up here. And so we'll just create that down here, public function add one, and it's gonna take X, that is an unsigned or assigned 32-bit integer. It's gonna return a 32-bit integer because we can add it to anything. It's gonna do X plus one. And so here we're gonna add a comment here just like they have adds one to the number given and then examples and we're just going to copy what they have here so i'll just go ahead and steal this 
and you see we have the same thing there. And so what I'm going to run is I'm going to run cargo doc. Out of your way here. Let's close that. Let's run cargo doc. Oh, I forgot to give the return type. So it tries, to, it does try to compile the code first, which is good. So I'm running cargo doc, it built, and now we can run cargo doc open. It's gonna open the doc as an HTML page here. So it builds HTML. And then what we can do is we can just open this in browser. So what I'll do is I'll reveal in Explorer. Or you know what we can do, we can reveal that here. I'm gonna open it up here. I'll open it up with my browser. Ah, and there you go. There's our documentation. And you can see here, <clears throat> We have the add one function and the main function. Main function doesn't have any documentation, but our add one function has documentation. And check that, check this out. Look how cool this is. You have the function signature, you have the description, and then it put the examples under this example setter. How awesome is that? Love that, right? How cool is that? Super easy to generate documentation. So that's pretty sweet. So for convenience, running cargo doc open, we'll build the HTML for the current creates documentation. Do that um, as well as the documentation of all your crates and dependencies so that's why we saw the main function there right and open the result in a web browser navigate to the add one function and you'll see how the text in the documentation comments is rendered and they're showing here just like we just saw commonly used sections so we use the examples right um, the markdown heading to create the sample HTML under the title examples here are some other sections that the crate authors commonly use in their documentation so we have panics, the scenarios in which the function being documented could panic. Callers of the function who don't want their programs to panic should make sure they don't call these functions in these situations. Errors, if the function returns a result, describing the kinds of errors that might occur and what condition might cause those errors to be returned can be helpful to callers so they can write code to handle the different kinds of errors in different ways. Pretty cool. Safety, if the function is unsafe to call, uh, we will discuss this in chapter 19 when we talk about unsafe rest. There should be a section explaining why the function is unsafe and covering the invariance that the function expects callers to uphold. We'll learn more about that in chapter 19. Most documentation comments don't need all of these actions or sections, but this is a good checklist to remind you of the aspects of your code that people calling your code will be interested in knowing about. So they want to know if it's safe, they want to know if it throws errors and what type the errors will be. And of course, they want to know if it panics and in what situations the panic may occur. Documentation comments as tests. Ooh. Adding example code boxing and documentation comments can help demonstrate how to use your library. And doing so as an additional bonus, running cargo tests will run the code examples in your documentation as tests. Ooh. Nothing is better than documentation with examples, but nothing is worse than examples that don't work because the code has changed since the documentation was written. Imagine giving bad documentation. Yo, some of you are like, yo, I can imagine I've done it. All right, respect, but we're gonna fix it, right? So if we run cargo test with the documentation for the add one function from listing 14.1, we'll see a section that test results like this. So this is pretty badass. I'm just gonna go ahead and move over here and we're gonna run cargo test and see if it tests. Look at that. Running zero test. It ran zero, what is it? Come on. Did I not do this right? Let's see. If we run cargo test with the documentation for add one function, we will see a section in the test that results like this. I don't see it. Here, let's try moving it. Let's move it up. I don't know if that's gonna help, but let's move it up here and see why it's not running. Maybe because I didn't write it in the lib. I don't know, let's try it again, cargo test. Didn't run. Do I need to add anything? Doc tests. Cargo tests will run the example. Uh, let's see. Examples, it's there. Add one. Ah, it might be because I have it prefixed, prefixed with my create add one. Let's try that. 
No? I don't know. I don't know. Excuse me. <coughs> not sure why it's not running. It might be because, uh, so here they're using a lib. We're not. That might be the issue. Let's try changing it. So we want a library binary. That might be the issue. Let's see. Yep, that was it. And so now it's saying it can't find add one in the scope. So what we can do is we could say, um, what is the name of this documentation? Yeah, documentation. There we go, it passed. So again, what did I do there? Um, I ran it, right? And as a, as a main binary, right? Um, but what we actually want is a library binary. So I converted it to librs and I just referenced the crate name and the function and my test ran. So pretty cool. Now, some of you may have seen this before. There are other languages that support this type of thing. And sometimes they're called doc tests. Python 3 actually has support for doc tests. Um, in all the Python libraries I've been a part of, none of them have used it well enough. So it's maybe not as widely used, although it's really awesome. So I highly recommend anyone writing Python to check it out. It's pretty sweet. If you're using another library or sorry, language like Elixir, Elixir also has doc tests, really fantastic. Um, and I'm sure you could probably make JS doc do something similar, but super powerful. You write your tests and your documentation at the same time, right? You kill two birds with one stone. So really uh, awesome, powerful feature. And like they said here, they never get out of sync, right? Because if your tests, doc tests fail, your documentation is probably incorrect or it failed because your code was modified and you need to update it. So pretty cool. All right, so we got that to pass. Now, if we change either the function or the example, so assert equal in the example panics and run cargo test again, we'll see that the doc test catches that the example and the code are out of sync with each other. So let's try that. So we're going to change either the function or the example. So they assert equal in the example panics. So let's do assert equal and we'll change this to five. So we'll assert that it actually does nothing. Now, if I clear, get out of your way and run cargo test. Yeah, there we go. We got main panicked, test failed. Awesome, so it actually reports that failure. So really cool. All right, commenting contained items. Another style of doc comment is slash slash exclamation point. It adds documentation to the item that contains the comments rather than adding documentation to the items following the comments. We typically use these doc comments inside the crate root file source lib by convention or inside a module to document the crate or the module as a whole. For example, if we want to add documentation that describes the purpose of the my crate crate that contains the add one function, we can add documentation comments that start with slash slash bang to the beginning of the source lib file. So let's see. So we have this here. So we can go ahead and put this here. So this is like common header documentation. So my crate, and we're going to call it documentation, is a collection of utilities to make performing certain calculations more convenient. Notice that there isn't any code after the last line that begins with slash slash exclamation point. Because we started the comments with slash slash exclamation point instead of slash slash slash, we're documenting the item that contains this comment rather than an item that follows this comment. So we're documenting the containing, like the, the, the whole lib, right? It's the containing. So if we put a comment like this in the function, we'd be talking about the function, right? Here, we're actually commenting on this function. So that this function doesn't contain this code, but the, the lib does contain this code. So that's the difference there. In this case, the item that contains this comment is the whole lib, which is the crate root. These comments describe the entire crate. When we run cargo doc open, these comments will display on the front page of the documentation for my crate above the list of public items in the crate. All right, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to run cargo doc open. It builds it. I'm going to open it here. Check that out. My crate documentation is a collection of utilities to make form calculations more convenient. We have our add one function. We can go back to the root 
So really cool. Look, we can we even add searchability. How awesome is this? Pretty cool, I must say. Very, very cool. All right, <clears throat> documentation comments within items are useful for describing crates and modules, especially. Use them to explain the overall purpose of the container to help other users understand the crate's organization. So it's like documenting your entire crate. So if you wrote a crate for random number generation, you would describe it and then you'd have the individual functions. And we've seen this as we look through the documentation of other crates or even internal modules, right? So really cool stuff. I love that it just generates it for you. I've used it on my um, other machine and it did in fact open the browser. I think I just haven't specified my default here. So it just gives me the HTML and I just click it and open it, but really cool. And in case anyone forgot, Cargo does contain, when you install Rust, by default, it includes all the Rust documentation. And so I believe, I forget what the exact command is, but Cargo, Hmm, I'll have to figure it out. But there is a command to just open the general Rust documentation locally. So if you didn't have access to the internet, but you have Rust installed, you have access to that code. So really cool, really powerful stuff. In chapter seven, we covered how to organize our code into modules using the mod keyword, how to make items public using the pub keyword, and how to bring items into a scope with the use keyword. However, the structure that makes sense to you while you're developing a crate might not be very convenient to your users. So even though it makes sense for you while you're developing it, it might not be the best way to release it, right? It might not be the best structure for users and consumers of that code. You might want to organize your structs in a hierarchy containing multiple levels, but then people who want to use a type that you've defined deep in the hierarchy might have trouble finding out that type exists. They might also be annoyed at having to enter use my create some module, another module useful type rather than use my create useful type. Now, this may be ringing a bell, right? If you've used other languages, maybe we're ringing a bell, like how do we export, right? You know, if you're familiar with JavaScript, we have these index files where we can do exports so that you don't have to go deep into a folder structure. So I'm kind of thinking we're gonna see something like that. The structure of your public API is a major consideration when publishing a crate. People who use your crate are less familiar with the structure than you are, right? They didn't make it and might have difficulty finding the pieces they want to use if your crate has a large module hierarchy. The good news is that if your structure isn't convenient for others to use from another library, you don't have to rearrange your internal organization. Instead, you can re-export items to make a public structure that's different from your private structure by using pub use. Yeah, it's exactly like index.html for the JavaScript people out there, come on. And we have this in Python too, right? Similar thing. Re-exporting takes a public item in one location and makes it public in another location, as if it were defined in the other location instead of the original. For example, say we made a library named Art for modeling artistic concepts. With this library are two modules, a kinds module containing two enums named primary color and secondary color, and a utils module containing a function named mix. All right, we'll just use our existing, we're just gonna use our existing documentation. Great. Um, so what we'll do is we'll we'll write this out. Let's, let's do it. So I'm gonna just change this to ah, you know, what we'll do we'll make a new one. Let's go. Let's go back here. Go back up a level. We'll do uh, let's do cargo new art. Jump into art here. Open that up. And close this one out now. All right, so we have cargo art. Oh, I wanted to make a lib. So here, let me just do that with cargo so we can see again how that's how you do that. So I didn't specify a lib. So what's going to happen is it's going to create a main file, but I can actually specify that I want a library binary. So what I'll do is I will go up a directory. I'll remove this folder called art. And now I will do let's see cargo new art lib i think that's how you do it create a library art package cool code dot get rid of that don't save move that here and there we go so now we have our art package oh i actually wanted to open up art itself there we go all right so now we have the art library, our Rust analyzer is kicked in and is ready to go. 
just got to install the latest version. Here's our lib. You can see it comes with tests. It looks a little different already than the main, right? That's expected. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to just copy some of this code here. So we're going to space that down there. We're going to change this to pub. Uh, we'll do pub mod kinds. And we'll make some documentation just like they have here. So we'll get rid of this for now and we'll just do slash slash exclamation point. We'll use a little formatting, right? That's going to be the markdown formatting. That's a header art, a library for modeling artistic concepts. That's some artistic spelling right there. All right, so mod kinds. We can get rid of this. We don't need this. And we're going to do a the primary colors according to the RYB color model. And what do we do here? We're just going to copy what they have here. Enum. So this is going to be a primary color that we're going to use an enum for this. It's going to have red yellow and blue and then here it says the secondary colors according to the ryb color model pub enum secondary color and that's going to have orange my favorite color green and purple all right, then down here, we're going to do pub mod utils. Use crate kinds. Um, there we have kinds, right? And now we're going to do, and that's going to be because we're an example of using our own crate. So we're going to do public function mix. It's going to take a color one, a primary color. It's going to take another primary color and it's going to return a secondary color. And here we don't have any code. So it's just snip. Um, and we would make a match, right? We'd say, okay, blue and yellow is going to give us green. Red and blue is going to give us purple. Yellow and red is going to give us orange and so forth. You just got a lesson on how to make colors. That's pretty cool. You didn't even ask for that. It's like a little bonus. You're welcome. All right. So. Figure 14.3 shows what the front page of the documentation for the crates generated by cargo doc would look like. We can see what it would look like here. I don't have to run it. We'll just see here. So this is what we're going to get. Art, a library for modeling concepts. You have kinds and utils. Note that the primary and secondary types aren't listed on the front page, nor is the mix function. We have to click kinds and utils to see them. So even though this organization makes sense for us, it's not the greatest end result for the user, right? They'd have to click in to see them. Another crate that depends on this library would need use statements that bring in the items from art into scope, specifying the module structure that's currently defined. So in the listing below, we see an example of a crate that uses the primary color and mix items from the art crate. So you can see that I have to pull in art kinds primary color, art utils mix. And then you let red, primary color red, yellow, primary color yellow, mix red and yellow. What do you get? You're going to get orange. Spoiler alert, right? So the author of the code in 14.4, which uses the art crate, had to figure out that the primary color is in the kinds module and mix is in the utils module because they weren't listed on that homepage, right? The module structure of the art crate is more relevant to developers working on art crate rather than developers consuming the art crate. The internal structure that organizes parts of the crate into the kinds module and the utils module doesn't contain any useful information for someone trying to understand how to use the art crate, right? Instead, the art crate's module structure causes confusion because developers have to figure out where to look. And the structure is inconvenient because developers must specify the module names in the use statements. So all that to say, it's just not easy to find, right? You're looking at it, you're like, uh, well, you got to click around, you got to use the search. Yeah, it's a minor inconvenience, but still, it's not the nicest thing, right? Um, so we can make it easier. And we're all about making it easier, right? Developers love making other developers' lives easier. That's why it's such a good community to be a part of. Come on, open source. Let's go. Documentation, come on. All right, so to remove the internal organization from the public API, we can modify the R crate code. 
in listing 14.3 to add pub use statements to re-export items at the top level. Yo, I'm feeling this. Let's do it. Let's do pub use. We're going to re-export these things. Ready? Pub use self. That's obviously the self, right? Kinds primary color. Right? I'm just going to copy this and we're going to do secondary color. Beautiful. And we're going to go ahead. I just realized I spelled this wrong. There we go. And kinds utils. And of course, mix. Okay. Now let's run that cargo doc code again. Cargo doc. Open. Oh. Cargo doc open. Expect to type. Ah, I forgot to return a type here. Mix returns a secondary color. Secondary colors according to the mm, expected enum you know, kind of secondary color found. Ah. Creates called art. Oh, create. Sorry, create kinds. Primary color. Why can't it find secondary color? Did I spell it wrong again? Secondary. It says, implicit returns as bodies no tail. Oh, because I'm not doing anything here. So we're just going to go ahead, just to make it compile, I'm just going to return. orange just just to do it just to get to compile all right so now it'll compile cargo doc open bam i'm just clicking it here there we go check it out re-exports pub use primary secondary mix check that out pretty cool now i can just click it look at that that's pretty awesome. Ooh, a lot of auto generated stuff. I guess we'll find out what that is. But that's pretty awesome. So the API documentation that cargo doc generates for this crate will now list and link re-exports on the front page. So it shows them, right? So we have primary, secondary color, and mix right there on the front page. The art crate users can still see and use the internal structure from listing 14.3 as demonstrated in listing 14.4, or they can use the more convenient structure in listing 14.5 as shown in listing 14.6. Lots of listing, lots of 14 dash, 14 dash, 14, right? But check it out, much nicer. Art mix, art primary color. So that's what the re-export's doing. So again, if you're coming from JavaScript, uh, it's a lot, you know, it's very similar to just having an index.js if you're used to React. You've likely used an index.js to export multiple components, right? If you use a design system or something, I'm sure you've used this because they, they re-export all the components, right? To make them accessible at the root level so you're not nesting. Um, so really, really cool way to make your crate more usable and accessible. In cases where there are many nested modules, re-exporting the types at the top level with pub use can make a significant difference in the experience of people who use the crate. Creating useful public API structure is more of an art than a science, and you can iterate to find the API that works best for your users. Choosing pub use gives you the functionality in how you structure your crate internally and decouples, right? It decouples that internal structure from what you present to your users. So you can write it however you want internally. It's decoupling that, and it's doing it in a nice way, right? Look at some of the code of crates you've installed to see if their internal structure differs from the public API. I'm down. Let's take that challenge. So one thing we've done here is we've used in guessing game, we use the random number crate. So let me open this up here. So here we have our random guessing game. So we used rand RNG, right? Rand RNG. And if you look, how do we pull that in? We pull it in with our dependencies and our TOML file. Now for some reason, my TOML file isn't getting syntax highlighting. So I'm going to just search Toml, install that. There we go. Much better. Okay, so here we can see our dependencies. 
not for that. I don't need that. I want to open up my folders here. Guessing game. So there's our guessing game toml. Zoom in there for you. So here we have rand 05.5. So let's look at the random and see if it's um, see if they're using this kind of re-exporting. And again, we're just importing RNG right from rand. So let's see how they have it structured. So let's go to Rust Rand. All right, Rand. Crate Rand, quick start. So this is documentation for the the overall crate. So they put this in their in their main source. And we'll look at the source in a second. But we can see the modules, functions, traits, errors, RNG. That's that's the trait we're using. So it is RNG is at the high level. It looks like. Um, let's see if there's any other examples we can check out because it looks like this one actually is just at the root level. But you know what? Let's take a look at the source and see. So if we go to the source, let's see RNGs. So yeah, it is defined here. Mod RNG. So in this case, in this case, it looks like it is just at the root level. Let's see. I'm trying to think if there's any other crates we've used in the past. Let's look at Fibonacci. Do we use anything there? I don't think so, but let's check. Nope. Uh, do we use any in our grep? Let's see if we used any in our grep function. So mini grep. No, no, nothing there. Well, I guess we could look at probably one of these. Um, let's see. Can we look at the standard library? We're in Rand here. All right, let's see. Yeah, this will probably be a little bit different. Primitive types modules than an actual crate. Let's try to look at a. Let's go to Rust here. Let's go to crates.io. See if we can find any examples there. Most downloaded. Rand, because everyone using the book, right? Yo, everyone following the streams, downloading Rand. For real, though. All right, let's check out a uh, quote. Quasi quoting. All right, let's check it out. Where is the source? So we got versions, keywords, license index, repetition, some good documentation here. Let's see if we can go to the repository. View code, lib. Pub use, look at that. ID fragment, token stream, X. So here, they're, they're exporting this here. Create ext, token stream ext. And so I bet in the documentation, Quote span quote. So I don't see the re-exports written down here. They're probably changing that, but pretty cool. There you go. Token stream ext right here. Pretty awesome. So that's cool. It lets you just expose your API, and even though your stru internal structure is different, so very cool, powerful stuff. I'm feeling it. All right, setting up a crates.io account. Yo, you ready? Before we can publish any crates, we need to create an account on crates.io and get an API token. To do so, visit the homepage of crates.io, log in via a GitHub account. The GitHub account is currently a requirement, but the site might support other ways of logging in in the future. Once logged in, visit your account settings at crates.io.me and retrieve your API key. Then run the cargo login command with your key like this. I'm not going to do this, obviously, on stream because I don't want to show my API key. Um, but we can check out crates.io. So you'll go here, you'll log in with GitHub, right? Log in with GitHub, get your token, run cargo login. And now you will have, this command will inform cargo of your API token and store it locally in cargo credentials. Note that this token is a secret. Do not share it with anyone else. Hence why 
Sorry, fam, can't really share with you. If you do share it with anyone for any reason, you should revoke it and generate a new token on crates.io. So what I can do is I can do this off screen, set it up, and then I will generate a new token post stream. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Let's pull this up over here, pop it off screen here so you can't see it there. And I will log in. Got to enter my code, bear with me, bear with me. I'll keep this up here for you. Put this back here. All right, let me just log in. I got, got to have the two factor. If you're not using two factor, you're not doing it right. You know what I'm saying? All right, let me just enter this in. All right, Clam Watson in the chat said, my password is Hunter2. Nice, dude, sick. All right. So let's go ahead and, sorry, I'm just opening back up crates.io here. All right, so I'm logged in here. I'm gonna get my API key. All right, I'm gonna run this command here. Give me a second, give me a second, give me a second. All right, I'm all logged in. So now I'm ready to go. Adding metadata to a new crate. Now that you have an account, let's say you have a crate you wanna publish before publishing you need to add some metadata to your crate by adding it to the package section of the crate's cargo toml file. All right, so let's go to our crate. This let's use this crate. Where is it? This one here. We're going to open up cargo.toml. And obviously we're not going to publish this crate, it's not very useful, but yeah, you know, just so we can see. So package name, guessing game. Ah, so here is an example with guessing game. So create a name. You need to be chosen a unique name when you run cargo publish to publish the crate. At this point, you'll get a warning with an error. Cargo publish, updating crates. A warning manifest is no description, license, license file documentation. So it tells you all the things you need. The reason that you're missing some crucial information here, a description and license are required so people will know what your crate does and under what terms they can use it, right? So maybe you have the MIT license, maybe you have that sketchy license that React used for a little while that told you that Facebook had owned any code that was using React, whatever, but gives you uh, that license. To rectify this error, you'll need to include the information in the cargo toml and a description that is just a sentence or two because it will appear in your crate in search results. For the license field, you'll need to give a license identifier value. The Linux Foundation Software Package Data Exchange, SPDX, list the identifiers you can use for the value. For example, to specify you've licensed your crate using the MIT license, add the MIT identifier. So similar to if you've used JavaScript, similar to like a package.json, right? So we'll do name license equals MIT, right? If you want to use a license that doesn't appear in the SPDX, you need to place the text of the that license in a file include the file in your project and then use license file to specify the name of the file instead of using license key. We're not going to mess with that. Guidance on which license is appropriate for your project is beyond the scope of this book and beyond the scope of this stream. Uh, many people in the Rust community license their projects in the same way as Rust by using a dual license of MIT or Apache 2.0. This practice demonstrates that you can also specify multiple license identifiers separated by an or to have multiple licenses for your project. With a unique name, the version, the author details, the cargo new added when you created the crate, your description and license added, the cargo toml file for a project that is ready to publish might look like this. Look at that. Guessing game version 0.1.0, your name, addition 2018, description of fun game where you guess what the number of the computer is chosen. It's not that fun, not gonna lie, but it's pretty cool. And the license. Cargo's documentation describes other metadata you can specify to ensure others can discover and use your crate more easily. Publishing crates to crates.io. 
Now that you've created an account, save your API token and chosen a name for your create and specify the required metadata. Let's go ahead and add some more metadata real quick. So we have version, license, authors. Y'all know my name, come on. I'm a girl, tom.mcgurl, at blah, blah, blah. Y'all know my email anyway. Um, and then addition, 2018, that's already there. Versions already there, oh, description. Oh, we already have authors, duh, come on. Description, so my description is going to be a fun example crate. Do not use for production, obviously. Seriously. All right, so now we're ready. License is MIT. All right, so now we specified all that stuff. We're ready to publish. Publishing crate uploads a specified version to crates.io for others to use. Be careful when publishing a crate because a publish is a permanent. The version can never be overwritten and the code cannot be deleted. One major goal of crates.io is to act as a permanent archive of code so that builds of all projects that depend on crates from crates.io will continue to work indefinitely, right? We want the code to work. That's important. Allowing version deletions would make fulfilling that goal impossible because you could publish a crate, someone could consume that crate and specify it as the version for their, their crate or maybe their project and release it. And then if you go ahead and remove that, they'll no longer be able to install that and it could be a problem, right? It definitely will be a problem. Allowing version deletions to make fulfilling that goal impossible. However, there is no limit to the number of crate versions you can publish. Run the cargo publish command again, it should succeed now. Congratulations, you've now shared your code with the REST community and anyone can easily add your crate as a dependency to their project. So let's do it. Let's do it with our guessing game, just because that's what they're using. I'm sure a lot of people have guessing games up there on the old internet, right? So let's go back here. Um, actually, let's publish mini grep. That'd be fun, right? Uh, so let's go back here. I'm just gonna publish mini grep. So let's see, where's my mini grep? Uh, I believe that's under chapter 12, yep. Mini grep. Uh, let's go ahead and open this up. And I'm just going to do the same thing here. Mini grep version description a mini clone of the grep utility, a fun project. I'll just leave it like that. I'm a girl, license and registration, please, MIT. And I think that was it, right? Tom McGurl at Gmail, description, license. Let's try publishing it. So I'm gonna move out of your way as usual. I'm constantly just getting, getting in your way. Cargo publish. And don't forget, I logged in off screen, so that's why it's working. Obviously, you'll have to follow the steps to log in if you're attempting to do this as well. Matt, um, Clam Watson in the chat is saying his password's Hunter too. So she hope, try that. If you're watching stream, if you're watching, try it. Clam Watson, username, password, Hunter two. Don't hack me. Hackers. All right, so it's fetching. We're all just gonna sit here and watch the progress. Just sit back. Watch the progress. Okay, it said manifest is no license. License file, ah, did I spell license wrong? Of course I did. I'm a genius, you figured this out. You've all figured this out. I know, I know. Let's try it again. Cargo publish, maybe it won't have to fetch. Has no documentation, homepage, or repositories. Mm. Why? It does. One file in the working directory contains changes that we're not committed to Git. Ah, let's go ahead and just do, oh, the cargo toml. Did we change the cargo toml? Oh, we didn't save it, it's gone. Ah, they're not committed to Git. Okay, that's fine. We're just gonna do allow dirty. I like it. 
building. API errors. A verified email address is required to publish crates to crates.io. Visit crates.io to set and verify your email address. I'm going to do that really quick off screen, which you all are going to enjoy very much. Let's go ahead and verify that. So I got to go to crates.io slash me. Email. Verify my email, everybody. Hang in tight. It's going to be quick. I promise. All right, they sent me a, they don't, they don't include these steps in the book. It's all right, it's all right. All right. Come on, there we go, there's my email. Confirmation, Crace.io, we're members now, we're members of the community, we're officially community members, this is amazing. The crate exists, but you don't seem to be an owner. Maybe this is a mistake. Perhaps you need to accept an invitation before. Ah, I'm sure it already exists. Like it's called mini grip, right? It definitely exists. So that's okay. We will move on. We'll move on. What do we do? There's already mini grip. We've lost. It's useless. We shouldn't even have made it. <laughs> no, it's fine. Just showing examples. No big deal. Publishing a new version of an existing crate. When you've made changes to your crate and are ready to release a new version, you change the version value specified in the cargo toml and republish. Use semantic versioning rules to decide what an appropriate next version number is based on the kinds of changes you've made. Then run cargo publish to upload a new version. If you're not familiar with semantic versioning, that's totally fine. Um, you basically have three values, major, minor, patch. We don't get into many details, but you can think of patch as a fix, something that won't break your code. You could think of the minor as something that adds API documentation, adds API surface, adds a few more functions, adds some logic without breaking changes. Maybe it deprecates changes, but without breaking, um, or it sets them up for deprecation, but doesn't break existing code. And a major patch is allowed to break old versions and old code, right? Functions get removed, functions get renamed. That would be a major. Uh, there's obviously a lot more documentation on that. Maybe we'll make a video on it. But yeah, semantic versioning is awesome. Removing versions from Crate.io with Cargo Yank. Although you can't remove previous versions of Crate, you can prevent any future projects from adding them as a new dependency, right? You can deprecate them. So if you've released a 2.0 and you no longer want to support one, you can yank it. This is useful when a Crate version is broken for one release or another. In such situations, Cargo supports yanking a Crate version. Yanking a version prevents new projects from starting to depend on that version while allowing all existing projects that already depend on it to continue to do so. Um, as they would. Essentially, a yank means that all projects with cargo lock will not break, but any projects with any future cargo lock files that would be using that version won't work. To yank a version of a crate, you just run cargo yank. Uh, by adding undo to the command, you can also undo a yank and allow projects to start depending on that version again. Pretty cool. Yank, I don't know how I feel about that name. Especially when we're talking about packages. I don't know. All right, cargo workspace. Very cool. What are workspaces? I'm excited. I want to know. I hope you all want to know. Cargo workspaces. In chapter 12, we built a package that included a binary crate and a library crate. That was our mini grep, which is right here. It included a library crate and a binary crate. Pretty cool. The binary creates this, the library creates here. So as your project develops, you might find that the library crate continues to get bigger and you want to split up your package further into multiple library crates. In this situation, Cargo offers a feature called workspaces that can help manage multiple related packages that are developed in tandem. Creating a workspace. A workspace is a set of packages that share the same Cargo lock and output directory. Let's make a project using a workspace. We'll add we'll use trivial code so we can concentrate on the structure of the workspace rather than the contents of the code. There are multiple ways to structure a workspace, so we're going to show one common way. We'll have a workspace containing a binary and two libraries. The binary, which will provide the main functionality, will depend on the other two libraries. One library will provide an add one function, and the second library will provide an add two function. These three crates will be part of the same workspace. We'll start by creating a new directory for the workspace. All right, let's do it. So. Let's go ahead. I'm going to back up here a little bit. Um, I'm going to go back into chapter 12. You can't see what I'm doing as per usual. All right, I'm just going to go here. I'm going to do 
chapter 14. Uh, we're going to do make dir add, cd add. And then I'm just going to open up add. Close mini grep here. And there's nothing in here. Um, so we're going to create a cargo.toml. So it says here next in the add directory, we create a cargo.toml file that will configure the entire workspace. The file won't have a package section, the metadata we've seen in other cargo tunnels. Instead, it will start with a workspace section that allows us to add members to the workspace by specifying the path to the package with our binary crate. In this case, the path is adder. All right, so let's do that. So we're going to create a new file. We're going to call it cargo, capital C, cargo.toml. In here, we're going to say workspace members equals adder. Awesome. Next, we'll create the adder binary crate by running cargo new within the add directory. Oh, interesting. OK, so let me just move over here. So I'm again out of your way. So we're going to run cargo new in this directory. We already have a high level cargo toml file. Pretty cool. OK, so let's run cargo new adder. Check it out. And Rust Analyzer isn't complaining. So if you remember, Rust Analyzer is always like, I can't find a toml file. This is why. It's looking for a workspace, right? It's looking for a toml file. Or in the case of a binary or library crate, it's looking for that cargo toml in here. OK. So here's what our folder structure looks like. We have adder, main, cargo toml. Here, maybe I can zoom in on that a little bit so you can see. Adder, source, main, and the cargo toml in here, and the one on the outside with the workspace declared. The workspace has one target directory at the top level for the compiled artifacts to be packaged into. Um, oh, we have to run cargo build. Let's run cargo build. Okay, there we go. Now we have target where it's putting this stuff, right? So it has a target directory at the top level for the compiled artifacts to be placed into. These are the ones that are compiled. The adder package doesn't have its own target directory. Notice that it didn't put the target directory inside adder. It put it here at the high level. So that's pretty cool. Cargo structures the target directory in a workspace like this because the crates in a workspace are meant to depend on each other. If each crate has its own target directory, each crate would have to recompile each of the other crates in the workspace to have the artifact in its own target directory. By sharing one target directory, the crates can avoid unnecessary rebuilding. Ooh. This is pretty cool. I like where this is headed. Creating the second package in the workspace. Next, let's create another member package in the workspace and call it add one. Change the top level cargo toml to specify add one path in the member list. So we're going to do add one. And here we're going to generate a library crate. So the first one was a binary crate. Now we're going to generate a library crate. So let's just go ahead and clear this. I'm going to do cargo new, add one, and we're going to specify lib. And so here, it created a library crate called add one. Very cool. OK, so your add directory should now have these directories, and it does. So we have our cargo lock, our cargo toml, our target directory, our adder, and our add one directory. So really great. In the add one source lib file, let's add an add one function. All right, so what I'm going to do is just zoom out one level here. I'm going to go to add one lib, and we're going to create a public function, add one. Let's do pub fun, add one. It takes a signed 32-bit integer, and it's going to return a signed 32-bit integer, and it's just new x plus one. Now that we have another package in our workspace, we can have the adder package with our binary depend on the add one package that has our library, right? First, we'll need to add a path dependency on add one to adder cargo toml. So in the adder cargo toml here, we're going to add add one as a dependency. And rather than specify it's coming from crates.io, we're going to specify its path. So we do add one equals path equals dot dot slash 
add one. And that's because we're going up a directory and we're adding that add one. Cargo doesn't assume that crates and a workspace will depend on each other. So we need to be explicit about the dependency relationships between the crates. Next, let's use the add one function from add one crate in our adder binary crate, our main RS. Open the main RS file and add a use line at the top to bring the new add one library crate into scope. Then change the main function to call add one function. All right, let's do it. So here we're going to go to our main. We're going to do use add one. Let num equal 10. Print ln. Hello world plus one is blank. And we're going to pass it num. And we're going to pass it add one, add one, which is the name of the function we exposed. Again, add one is the name of the crate, and add one is the name of the function we exposed, and we're going to pass it num. And now we're going to run cargo build. Let's run cargo build here. There we go. We see our target. All right, so we ran cargo build, the top level add directory, right? and it built it. To run the binary crate from the add directory, we can specify which package in the workspace we want to run by using the p argument and the package name with cargo run. All right, let's try it. Cargo run dash p adder. There we go, hello world. 10 plus one is 11. That's pretty sweet. This is cool. We have a little workspace. I love it. Depending on an external package in a workspace. So right now, up to this point, we've only depended on internal packages, right? Notice that the workspace has only one cargo lock file at the top level of the workspace, rather than having a cargo lock in each crate's directory. This ensures that all crates are using the same version of all dependencies. If we add the ran package to the adder slash cargo toml and add one cargo toml files, cargo will resolve both those to one version of rand and record that in the cargo lock, making all crates in the workspace use the same dependency means the crate in the workspace will always be compatible with each other. So they, they use the same cargo lock to ensure that compatibility. Let's add the ran crate to the dependencies section in the add one cargo toml file to be able to use the random crate in the add one crate. So let's go ahead in our cargo toml and add one. And let's add the dependency for random number. 0.5.5. We can now use rand to the add. So we can now add use rand to the add one librs file. That's going to let us pull that in and build the whole workspace by running cargo build in the add directory. And it'll bring in and compile the rand crate. So let's go ahead and run cargo build. And check it out. Our cargo lock at the top level now includes RAND. There's no cargo lock included here. It's at the top level of the workspace, so that's super cool. The top level cargo lock now contains the information about the dependency of add one on RAND, right? So it's showing that dependency. However, even though RAND is used somewhere in the workspace, we can't use it in other crates in the workspace unless we add RAND to their cargo toml files as well. For example, if we add use RAND to the main RS for the adder package, we'll get an error. So it does need to be specified in the dependencies in the tomls for each of the specific binaries. To fix this, edit the cargo toml file for adder package and indicate that rand is a dependency for that as well. So in adder, we're going to go to the cargo toml. We're going to indicate that rand is a dependency here as well. We're going to run cargo build again. And again, no cargo toml file, but our cargo lock shows rand as a dependency for adder and as a dependency for add one. So pretty cool. For another enhancement, let's add, oh, so wait, here it says, um, 
add it to the adder, but no additional copies of RAM will be downloaded. Cargo has ensured that every crate and every package in the workspace using the RAM package will be using the same version. Using the same version of RAM across the workspace to save space because we won't have multiple copies and ensures that the crates in the workspace will be compatible with each other, right? So that's key. Adding a test to a workspace. For another enhancement, let's add a test of the add one, add one function within the add one crate. Okay, let's do it. So let's go to our add one. There's our live live file. Um, so we're gonna do here, we're gonna do our classic config. And we're gonna do test mod tests, and then we're going to use super, and then we have test, and then function it works, testing that, of course, it works, and we're going to assert equal three comma add one to two. All right, now we're on cargo test in the top level add directory. So here we are in the top level add directory. And so I'm gonna run clear and cargo test. And there we go. It ran the test from our add one, right? We didn't have to go into that, that folder. It actually ran it from the top level. So the first section of the output shows that it works test in the add one crate passed. The next section shows that zero tests were found in the adder crate. So we can see that here. So we see running test in add one, running one test, test result, okay, one passed. Then here running an adder, zero tests found. So pretty cool. And of course, doc tests, there's no doc tests. So awesome. Running the cargo test in a workspace structure like this will, will like this one will run the test for all the crates in the workspace. We can also run tests for a particular crate in a workspace from the top level directory by specifying the package with the dash P just like we did for cargo run. So if we just do clear, clear that out. If I just do cargo test dash P add one, it just runs those tests. So it tries to run those tests and doc tests, but of course we have no doc tests. Let's try adding a doc test since we're familiar with it now. So let's do function that that adds one to the number provided. We can do examples. Let num equal one one six 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 five one one six and we will say assert equal one one seven comma add one to num and look my editor here actually has a run doc test so I'm gonna try running it failed because add one is not a function. Ah, we have to do uh, what is it? Self. Add one. Oh, we have to do add one, add one. Like that, I believe. Let's try running that again here failed what did it say failed add one not found in the scope cannot find value add in this scope oh add one add one hmm. what did I do wrong let's see let's open up our docs here art we have an example how do we do this again Let's see, let's see, let's see. We have chapter 14, documentation. Let's see what this looks like. Documentation, yeah, so it's the crate name, add one. Let's try it again, let's see what we're doing wrong. 
examples. All right, let's see. Add one is the name of this thing, right? Add one, add one. Let's do this, let answer equal add one, add one, num, answer. All right, let's try running it now. Actually here, let's run it here at the root. So cancel this terminal and let's clear this out. I'm just gonna run cargo test, add one. Failed and it says, failed to resolve use of undeclared type or module one. Ah, it's because it doesn't like the name of this crate. What's our name here, add one. Interesting. Ah, I wonder if we need to do interesting. Okay, so I called it add dash one. I called the folder add dash one, but I need to specify it like add one because it doesn't recognize its name. It uses underscore. So that's interesting. And look, it did run my test. So it actually ran my doc test now, one passed. So pretty cool, but interesting. That's a uh, cool thing that tripped me up. So the output shows cargo test only ran the test for add one crate and didn't run the adder tests. If you publish the crates in the workspace to crates.io, each crate in the workspace will need to be published separately. The cargo publish command does not have an all flag or a P flag. So you must change to each crate's directory and run cargo publish explicitly on each crate. Oh, well, that's fine. For additional practice, add an add two crate to this workspace in a similar way as the add one crate. As your project grows, consider using workspaces. It's easier to understand smaller individual components than one big blob of code. Furthermore, keeping the crates in a workspace can make coordination between them easier if they are often changed at the same time. All right, let's add an add two crate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and open up a terminal here. Let me move out of your way here. All right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create, we have our adder add one. We're going to create a new library called add two cargo new add two dash dash lib. Create that new library crate. There we go. Oh, and it gave us a little message. Let's see what it says. Compiling this new crate may not work due to the invalid workspace configuration. That's pretty cool. And that's because we didn't update our cargo toml to include add two. So there we go. Now we have that. So that's pretty great. That actually tells you what, what's going on there. Okay. So add two, just like add one, right? Where we just have a public function add one. We can even just copy this, add two. We'll just leave this doc test, right? We'll just modify it because we don't actually need, we'll use the doc test as our test. So add two, num, awesome. So now let's run cargo test. Okay, check this out. So here we, oh, we have to name this add two. Okay, so let me go and run this now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run cargo test. And check this out. It starts out, let me make this a little bigger for everybody. So it started out by running one test in add one. So it ran that test. That was the one test. There were, it had zero regular tests in add two and zero regular tests in adder, our binary crate. But then I wrote doc test for add one and add two, and it ran one doc test for add one, running one test, and it ran the doc test for add two as well. So pretty cool. So we're using doc test there. We're using our workspaces. So that's pretty awesome. And of course we can modify adder to use add two as well. So to do that, we'll say use add two. And to do that, we have to specify as a dependency. See if I do this, it says unresolved import. So again, we just go to our cargo toml. We specify the path to add to and that it's a dependency. 
We save that. Now we will no longer have this message. Once I run cargo build. Cargo build. All right, so it says here, let me just make this a little bigger so you can see. All right, so I went into our adder cargo toml. I specified add two as a dependency here. In my main, it's saying unresolved import. I think that's just because I hadn't imported it. There we go, now it's there. And I will actually make a call to it. So we'll say, plus two is, I'll pass it num, clear that, cargo run, 10 plus one is 11, 10 plus two is 11, that's false, we just need to call two there. Uh, and here it says add two, can I find function add two in create add one? That's because I need to specify here, add two. Now if I run clear, cargo run, 10 plus one is 11, 10 plus two is 12. And now you may be wondering, um, we used num, right? It wasn't mutated. And the reason it wasn't mutated is because num uses the copy trait, right? So it didn't add one, doesn't take ownership, um, right? It just uses the copy trait. It's just a integer. So I can reuse num again and it will have its original value because it wasn't borrowed. Cool, awesome. All right, moving on, moving on. Installing binaries from crates.io with cargo install. What's this about? The cargo install command allows you to install and use binary crates locally. This isn't intended to replace system packages. It's meant to be a convenient way for Rust developers to install tools that others have shared on crates.io. Ah, so we've installed library crates, but a binary crate would be like something else. Like if we shared our guessing game, that would be a binary crate, right? No one's going to import that as a dependency to their project, but they could say, um, download it and play, right? So that's a way to share a binary. Uh, note that you can only install packages that have binary targets. A binary target is a runnable program that is created if the crate has a source main file or another file specified as the binary, as opposed to a library crate targets that so, oh, as opposed to a library crate target that isn't runnable on its own, but is suitable for including within other programs. So libraries are dependencies for other programs, right? They allow you to do things within your program, whereas a binary crate can be executed on its own as a binary, like our guessing game, like our mini grep, for example, right? Usually crates have information in the readme file about whether a crate is a library, has a binary target, or both. All binaries installed with cargo install are stored in the installation roots bin folder. If you installed Rust using RustUp, which we did, and don't have any custom configurations, this directory will be home cargo bin. Ensure that directory is in your path to be able to run programs you've installed with cargo install. For example, in chapter 12, we mentioned that there's a Rust implementation of the grep tool called ripgrep for searching files. If we want to install ripgrep, we can run the following, cargo install ripgrep. All right, I will run it. So let's go ahead and I will actually leverage my terminal for this. Pull that up. Let's open up a shell here. All right. We're just going to run cargo install rip grep. It's downloading all the packages here. All right, all right. Let's see, let's see. All right, so it's installing ripgrep. And then once it's installed, the second to last line of the output shows the location, the name of the installed binary, which in this case of ripgrep is RG. As long as the installation directory is in your path, as mentioned previously, you can run rg-help and start using a faster, rustier tool for searching files. And in this case, rustier is a good thing, right? That's why we're here. Said it once, say it again. We're we're like almost, I mean, I think we're like mini rust stations at this point. We're not, not like full crabs, but yo, we're in it. We're in chapter 14, we're rust stations, right? So like package, rip grep, installed, executable rg. So that's the, the command that we can execute. So let's try running it, rg dash dash help 
Well, and there we go. We got the help for rip grep, a rustier tool for searching files. Pretty cool. Look at this help. A lot of stuff here. A lot of stuff here. A lot of stuff here. Wow. Our mini grep didn't do any of this. I'll tell you that we could, we can go pro. We could do it. We could build this, but it's already built. We're going to need to leverage something the community already built. Wow. I'm still scrolling. Wow. Rip grep everybody. Shout out to Andrew Gallant for creating this. Fantastic. All right. Last but not least, extending cargo with custom commands, right? Cargo, let's close that. Cargo is designed so you can extend it with new subcommands without having to modify cargo. If a binary in your path is named cargo something, you can run it as if it was a cargo subcommand by running cargo something. So again, if your binary in your path is named cargo something, you can run it as if it was a cargo command by running cargo something. Custom commands like this are also listed when you run cargo list. Being able to use cargo install to install extensions and then run them just like the built-in cargo tools is a super convenient benefit of cargo's design. So let's try it. Let's run cargo list and see what the available commands are. Make this a little bit bigger here. We'll get rid of the sidebar and we'll run cargo list. So these are some of the commands we have. So we have B, which is an alias for build. So we can just run cargo build. I'm sure we can run cargo R for run. That's pretty cool. So we don't have to fully type out cargo run. Uh, Rust C, compile, right? Cargo bench, execute all benchmarks for a local package. Build, we've used. Check, we've used. Clean, remove artifacts that cargo has generated in the past. That's pretty cool. Doc, we used. Fetch, fetch dependencies of a package from the network. Fix, automatically fix lint warnings reported by Rust. That's pretty sweet. Generate lock file, git checkout. This subcommand has been removed. Init, create a new cargo package in an existing directory. So instead of creating a new directory like cargo new blank, you go into a directory and then you run cargo init to create it in the directory you're currently in. That's pretty cool. Install, install a Rust binary, which we did. Locate project, print a JSON reputation of a cargo toml files location. Log in, save an API token. We did this, or I did this off screen, if you remember. New, we've used owner, manage the owners of a crate on the registry. Package, assemble the local package and distributable tarball. PKGID, print a fully qualified package specification. Publish, which we tried today. Read manifest, Rust doc. Ah, build a package documentation using specified custom flags. Compile a package and pass extra options to the compiler. Yank, version vendor so pretty cool there's a lot of cool stuff and there's more that we can get with uh, custom rust commands so that's pretty sweet sharing code with cargo and crates.io is part of what makes the rust ecosystem useful for many different tasks rust standard library is a small and stable so the rust standard library is small and stable it's not there's not a ton of stuff going on they're not importing all the apis for doing everything they keep it small and stable but crates are easier to share use and improve on a timeline different from that of the language. So by having the crate separate, they can make progress on their own as part of open source, right? They can continue to develop without us having to worry about modifying the standard library. We can keep that small, stable, very, you know, it's not going to ever break. We're going to keep it just compact, stable. And when you need to pull in stuff, you'll pull in a crate and that crate can progress as needed. Don't be shy about sharing code that's useful when to you on crates.io. And hey, if we create something useful here, I'm putting on crates.io. And I hope if any of you go out and work on Rust and you create useful code, even if you say, hey, you know, I don't know if it's, this happens a lot, right? We say, ah, oh, it's not that good. We get a little imposter syndrome or ah, oh, no one's gonna wanna use this. They're gonna make fun of it when it's out there or the codes, oh, it's not the best, it could be better. Don't feel that way. Just share it. If you're getting usefulness out of it, share it. And what I've seen, at least so far, and everyone in the Rust community, who I've chatted with either on Twitter or, you know, in person, that hasn't happened. That's a lie, right? I haven't seen anyone in months, <laughs> months, but you know, you, all of you, everyone's super friendly and you know, you'll get, you, you put it up there and if people use it, you'll see some people downloading it. Maybe some people will contribute. So yeah, if you find something useful, you create something useful. Maybe you created a tool for left padding. You all know about that left pad or something. Maybe create a tool that adds a funny word to the end of a string. Who knows? Whatever. Share it. Share it on crates.io. Get some experience putting stuff up there. I'm hoping we can do that. Um, 
But yeah, it's likely that if you find it useful, as they say here, uh, someone will, someone else out there will find it useful as well. Awesome. Well, that is it for chapter 14. Our next chapter is looking crazy. Why? Because it's got the word smart in it and the word pointers in it. We are not going to start that tonight uh, because we're already at 1030. We'll end a little bit early today, but this way we can just tie a nice bow on chapter 14. Um, that was pretty sweet. We got a good amount done. We learned about doc tests. We learned about documentation. We learned about crates. I'm really excited about the doc tests. I, you could probably have, you know, tell from that, but I, I really am excited about that because I love that you get two things for the price of one, right? You get the documentation and you get the test and they stay in sync and that's super powerful. Now, what, should everything go on doc tests? No, absolutely not. That's why we have the unit testing structure that we have. Um, but it is nice to test functions and test some common examples of your code. Obviously, you're not going to use doc test to test the error scenarios. You're testing generally the happy path with doc test to instruct your users on how to use your module. So unit tests are still very useful for doing things like testing the error scenarios, testing that something panics, and testing use cases beyond maybe the happy path or a very simple example. So of course, when used in combination, doc tests and unit tests, very powerful stuff. Awesome to see how Rust generates the documentation. I don't know if you all are getting the same feeling I'm getting, but like it seems so far to me like Rust cares a lot about the developer experience. They want to let us create safe code. They're giving us that developer build versus the production build where it compiles faster, but maybe isn't as the runtime isn't as fast. Except when you go the production version, the release version, as they call it, you're getting you know a, a stricter compilation with the expense of it taking a little longer. So they're really thinking about the developer experience. How can we make development really nice? We saw with workspaces, how they can make developing multiple library binaries and I'm sorry, library crates and binary crates easy with workspaces. So a lot has been going into the developer experience. You can tell by those error messages. They're fantastic, fantastic error messages. The documentation is super easy to write. So I'm enjoying it. We're on chapter 14. I'm starting to feel like I'm getting a hang of this thing, but with any language that I learned, I don't really get a good feel for it until I build something. And luckily we've already built a few things. We built that mini grep, which was awesome. We built the guessing game. I'm hoping to build more stuff. As I do, I will definitely be sharing it. We'll be doing some live, I'm sure. But hey, we're gonna keep going. We've made it this far. We're gonna do chapter 15 next week, chapter 16, 17. We'll see how far we can get. It's looking like the, the some of these later chapters are a bit shorter. Um, there's a few that are long, but we'll get through them. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And then we'll build some stuff. And again, keep an eye out. I'm probably gonna put something up about how to make an API request with Rust. I know that it's something that I've always wanted to wonder. Anytime I touch a new language, I always wonder, okay, what's it like to talk to a you know, a distributed server somewhere and get a response? Uh, coming from JavaScript, something we do all the time. I do it in Python with the request library as well. Elixir, I'm using HTT Poison to make requests. Uh, so it's always something fun to learn and you know, it, that's what makes it useful, right? Sometimes you want to hit an API and pull some data. So keep an eye out for that. But that is it for tonight. Chapter 14 is covered. Again, if you missed anything, just go ahead and always check that YouTube. I'll be putting the video for tonight up tomorrow. Uh, sorry about last week, I didn't get the video up till Thursday, but I'll try to get it up tomorrow. Again, follow on Twitter for the updates and I'll push all the code we did here today with the exception of my API key. I know you're all looking for it, but I will be putting it up on GitHub. Um, so that's that's it. I hope you all had a fun night. Thank you for stopping by the stream. If you're watching live, if you're watching on YouTube, I appreciate it. Uh, always much appreciate hitting that subscribe button to get the notifications. It's been awesome to see the comments. If you have any comments at all, you wanna know what theme I'm using, um, I'll add it to the show notes, but feel free to put a comment if I don't remember to do that. If you have any questions, comments, anything, feedback, leave in the comments on YouTube or in the chat. We got Clam Watson. I clicked subscribe three times. Wow, he clicked it three times. So that means he subscribed, he unsubscribed, and he resubscribed. Look at that. So he's spamming that subscribe button. You can do the same. If not, if you're not interested, don't worry. Just watch it. Just consume it. It's, I'm here for you. I'm here for you, you know? Come on. So have fun with it. Uh, enjoy the stream, and everyone have a good night. We'll catch you here next week with Chapter 15. Later. <laughs>